All right, so what we're going to do now is I'm going to demonstrate the various types of mechanical calibration um, that you need to conduct before your first patient of the day. So what we're doing right now is checking that the machine is in good working order, that it's reading volume um, at the various flow rates before you test your first patient of the day. So what you need to do to start off with is you need your spirometer. So I've got my spirometer. And then you need your various pieces. You need a three liter calibration syringe, which is verified. So I'm going to show you how I check that in a moment. I have the mouthpiece that I'm going to use. I have my syringe connector. And then if you are going to use a filter on a patient, you would connect your filter when you're actually doing the calibration check. So let's start off by looking at the syringe. So when it comes to um, caring for your syringe, the first thing that you're going to do before you use it is you're going to do a visual check. All right, so basically you're gonna check your syringe that there's no cracks in the housing, um, there's no missing screws, that there's no, um, uh, cracks in the plastic and everything looks like it's in good working order. So I'm happy with that. Right, the next thing I'm going to do is a, is a smoothness check. So if I put the syringe down here, what I'm doing is just checking that the plunger is moving nice and smooth. And you can see how I never press on the syringe handle with my full weight like that, because when you do that, it often causes it to jiggle, 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 jiggle as it goes in. So the syringe seems to be in very good working order. Let me check for leaks. So I would occlude the outlet, push in the syringe handle. There's no give. This is fine. There's no issues here. Let me occlude it properly. See, I'm pushing as hard as I can. There's nothing leaking. So I'm actually happy with the syringe. And the next thing that I do is I check my spirometry syringe validation certificate. And I can see that this one was calibrated on the 5th of the 2nd, 2020, and it's due to be calib calibrated or checked again on the, 6th or on the 4th of February, 2021. So that's looking good. So I'm happy with this. And what I do is I actually keep my certificate on the syringe so that I know which syringe is validated and when it needs to be revalidated again. So what I'm going to do is I'm first of all going to connect up my pieces. So I'm making sure that it's inserted properly. Um, and now what I'm going to do is um, let's put the let's put the piece onto the syringe. Okay, so this is the connector for this particular type of type of spirometer. All right, and then what I do is I put, actually, let me take this off and demonstrate it. So what I do then is I put the long arm to the short side, okay? And the short arm to the long side. So I put it in and I support it like this with my fingers and turn it over. If you don't do that, you will find that these little arms will break off very quickly. Let me just show you one more time. Long arm to the short side, short arm to the long side. You put it in, supporting it over the thing, supporting with your fingers tightly, you twist it, okay? And then it's onto the machine. So there you go. So now I'm gonna connect it to my syringe. So what I'm making sure here is that there's no leaks anywhere in the circuit. Now, as I said to you, um, in the time of COVID, um, what you might need to do is calibrate using the bacterial filter that you're going to use at the time of testing. So in this circuit, it fits on the back here. So let me just connect it up. There we go, it's looking good. And I have my circuit all ready now for the calibration check. Okay, so when it comes to this software, the very first thing that you need to do is go into check your environment. Okay, so remember that before you calibrate your machine, you've got to make very specific uh, entry of the ambient conditions at the room of test at, at the time of testing. So here I'm entering, I'm looking at my weather meter and my digital weather meter tells me that it's 24.3 degrees. I think this software only takes, yes, it doesn't take a point. Um, so I put it into the closest um, number. Then we look at our humidity. The humidity is reading on my weather meter at 44%. So I've entered that and then the altitude, I'm at sea level here in Durban. So the altitude 
will then be converted into a barometric pressure. I then press my recalculate BTPS. So what that means is that the ambient conditions at the time of calibration will be corrected to receive a patient at body conditions, at body temperature, pressure, and humidity. So I press that and you can see what the correction factor is over here. I'm going to save those environmental conditions. And now I go into my calibration program. And what you can see here is that in the mechanical calibration, you have three different programs that you can use. You have your single flow, which is simply a volume calibration check. You have your multi-flow, which is where you're looking at the volume at different flow rates, but just one pump of the syringe on each of the different flow rates. And then you have a linearity check, which makes you do three pumps of low, three pumps of medium, and three pumps of high of the volume to read at each flow rate. So let's look at these one by one. So I'm going to start by doing a single flow calibration, a volume check. Okay, so before I start pumping the syringe, I just make sure that my, my actual spirometer is not off the table because what will happen is it will fall off and onto the floor and be broken. So be very careful every time you calibrate that your whole circuit is actually safe on the table. All right, so now I'm going to go into my different software. We're going to start with a straightforward volume calibration. So basically what I'm doing is I'm showing you all three of the different volume calibration checks that you can do. And I'm starting with a volume calibration. Now with a volume calibration, it doesn't matter how fast or slow you move the syringe. Um, what I have to do to start with is I have to block the outlet so that the baseline setting is correct. So it doesn't pick up any of the air movement in the room. Okay, it's done that. So now what I'm going to do is start. And as I said to you, it doesn't matter how fast or slow I actually move the syringe. There you go. All right, so that's one. I just do three exactly like this. Okay, so let's go again. That's my second one. Loves it. And then I add a trial. And that is my last one. Good. So I have three pumps of the syringe. It says that um, I need to maybe go, keep going. So it's not satisfied that the volume is reading correctly. So I'm just going to keep going. Okay, keep going. So again, it doesn't matter how fast or how slow you move your syringe. Um, at the moment, the machine is only reading the volume. It's not reading the volume at different flow rates. So there we go. We've got two good ones so far. We're looking for three. And remember, can you see how I'm moving my syringe to touch every time I move it so that I have a correct measurement? So now the calibration check is completed. Um, I can go to my report. I will... I will now assess my report by looking at the date and time, which is correct. I look at my ambient conditions, which are all within the ranges allowed. I look at my volume in expired and inspired, and I can see that they are within the allowed 3% or 90 mils of my syringe volume. Um, and that's it. And then this calibration is valid for volume because the, the measured volumes are within 3% of the syringe volume, I can now save this test. I can either print it and sign and date it, or I can keep it in the software of the, of, of the computer. All right, so now what I'm going to do is now we're going to do the next kind of calibration check. So I'm going into Utilities, Configuration, sorry, utilities and calibration. And we're going to do a multi-flow calibration check. So how does this differ? We need, now need to move the syringe at different flow rates. Okay, so first of all, set the flow. Right, and now my first one is very, very slow. Can you see how slowly I'm moving the handle of the syringe? Very, very slowly, the machine gives you guidelines. Every spirometer is different. The software of every spirometer is slightly different. 
Okay, and that's my low flow. Now I'm going to do medium flow. So you can see that I move the syringe handle a little bit more quickly. All right, and it, you just keep on pumping until it's happy. All right, and now I'm going to do a high flow rate. So you'll see I move the syringe handle very quickly. All right, good. Okay, and so I have a complete uh, multi-flow calibration check. Good, now, the, the one that you, that you need to do, the most important calibration check is your linearity check. So now this is the one that you will do daily, all right, before your first patient of the day. Firstly, to set the baseline flow, you occlude the outlet so that it doesn't measure any airflow through the air. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to pump my syringe at different flow rates. And you can see that I'm moving the syringe very, very, very softly using just two fingers. I am just pumping the syringe very, very softly. So that, that one was good. That was within low flow. We're now going to do a medium flow. There we go. Medium flow. Okay, and that one was good. And now what we're going to do is our high flow. So we're going to move the syringe handle very, very quickly. Okay, good. Now we've done one set of low, medium and high. Now we're going to do our second set. So you've got to have three lows, three mediums and three high flows for a linearity calibration check. So this is my low flow, my second low flow. I need to keep it very, very slow. Okay, that's good. And remember, did you see how I pull my syringe handle out totally before I do the next one? Okay, so I'm going to do my medium flow. Medium, 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 medium. That's it, it's very good. And I keep it all the way out before the next trial. Very importantly is you need to make sure that you touch, okay? If you don't touch, then you might be missing a little bit of air. So some of the mistakes that are made are when people do that. And you see how they leave that little gap there? Can you see that? You'll never get a correct calibration if you don't push it in all the way and if you don't pull it out all the way, okay? Because then obviously your measurements will not be correct. Also, be careful not to push down too hard on it. Make sure your arm is not ever in front of um, the, the, the device itself. Good. Let's add another one. Okay, so we've got low flow. So this is our third low. So we're getting to the last round of checking. Okay, so we just, okay, that one was good. Now I do a medium flow. There we go. Medium flow. Okay, and then I do a high flow. Okay, so fast in and out. And remember to touch every side. Good, okay, so our calibration, our linearity check has been completed successfully. So now we can go on to testing the patient. So what I'm doing now is I'm running a basin of warm soapy water to just finish the washing and rinsing of my meter dose inhalers and all the equipment I use today. They've been soaking in the Milton for at least 20 minutes. I'm going to throw them into my basin of warm soapy water. So they've been, there we go, let's put that aside. And what I do is I focus on rubbing the, the mouthpieces. Okay, so I take all the proteins off any part that was actually in contact with the patient's mouth. I do not stick anything inside these. I do not use any uh, abrasive cloths or green sponges or anything like this. I just uh, rinse off everything. Okay, so I wash each one of these individually using nothing, as I say, nothing abrasive on anything. Okay, just using the soft gloves. But wherever the mouth has touched, I'm making sure that I clean the proteins off thoroughly and I agitate everything in the warm soapy water. Okay, right. So once we've finished washing everything, so you can see the sponges of the nose clips, I'm particularly rubbing and washing to wash off anything that's been on them. You can throw them away. Nose clips are disposable as well. If you want to reuse them, you need to wash them thoroughly. Okay, so now I'm going to let the water out of the basin and I'm going to now rinse my devices under, 
just tepid water. Right, so I'm rinsing them off now. Thoroughly, you can see I'm not rubbing the inside of the metered, uh, of the spacer devices. Okay, so I just rinse everything off. There we go, and we're done. So now I take a nice clean cloth, I lay it out, okay. Okay, and I take my newly washed um, equipment and I just shake it off a little bit to make sure that all as much water is off as possible, but you can see that I don't rub it in any way and I leave it out to dry, so. There we go, right. So that's all nice and ready. And by tomorrow morning, when we want to test again, it'll all be dry and clean and fresh and sterilized. So when the patient is finished with the device and is left, you can actually just, on this spirometer, you can actually wipe it down um, with an antibacterial wipe. Okay, very simply. So all you have to do is really just clean the outer part of this spirometer. So you would clean it before and after the patient actually blows. Okay. Right. Right, and that's it. So this spirometer has been cleaned as much as you can do. So um, to clean this spirometer, what we need to do is pull out the entire middle section. This is a pneumatech. We pop it into our Milton, okay? and we leave it there to soak for 20 minutes. Okay, then what we do is we just take our antibacterial wipes. And we clean the device, okay? So you never go inside these devices, okay? You only clean the outside. And as I said, never with very wet things. This is about as wet as you can use because water will damage the spirometer. All right, and that's it, it's clean. Right, so the inside actually sits in the sterilizing solution for about 20 minutes, maximum an hour, and then you take it out, shake off the excess, and leave it to dry ready for use the next morning. Okay, just a quick demonstration of how to administer a bronchodilator through the nebulizer device. So here I've got my bronchodilator, I'm just going to to open it, make sure that it is not expired. Okay, so I take one nebule of five milligrams of a salbutamol based bronchodilator. All right. And what I do is, first of all, I connect up my nebulizer. Check that it is working which it is, all right, I put, I open the nebule, there we go, as I say, five milligram, five milligrams of salbutamol, pop the nebule into the nebulizer, okay, connect it all up, you have the mask, and then you simply place the mask on the child you start it, can you see the smoke coming out? All right, so the child simply breathes in and out, in and out for as about 10 minutes or so. When this starts, when this starts spluttering, um, it means that the medication is finished and you can then remove it from the child. And from that point, you wait 15 to 20 minutes um, to retest them with your post bronchodilator spirometry. So what we have here is the first example of a calibration report and I'm going to take you through the steps to reporting on this actual test result itself. So if you look up at the top here, what you can see is that this is a linearity calibration check, different to the volume calibration and the multi-flow calibration, which I'm going to show you in a different session. 
And it doesn't matter which kind of calibration report you have, you're always going to follow the same six steps to reporting on the, on the calibration itself. So the very first thing you would do is look at the date and time. So if you look at the date and time, um, this was correct, this was the date that I did it, I underline it and I check it and for you to learn I'm just putting my numbers in as well. Step number two would look, be looking at your ambient conditions, here's your temperature, humidity and pressure. So let's just put a little number two here at the side. Okay, we want to make sure that we are using the spirometer within the allowed ranges for temperature, pressure and humidity. So 24 degrees, our range allowed was 17 to 35 degrees Celsius on the temperature. On the humidity, it was between 30, it should be between 30 to 75 percent. Okay, and on your ambient pressure, it should be between 600 and 1100 hectopascals. So all of these are within the ranges, so I would just put a little tick next to each of those because all of those are within the allowed ranges. Okay, step number three is looking at your measured volumes against your syringe volume. So let's just put a little number three in the, in the margin here. So you can see that your expected volume here is three liters in, on every flow rate. And here we see our volume expired. So this line here is volume expired. And this line here is the volume inspired. So looking at that, we, what we know, what's our range allowed? We know that we are allowed a difference of a maximum of 3% or a volume of 90 mils. So on the volume, we're allowed a 90 mils plus or minus 3 liters, which is the syringe volume. And at the same time, we're allowed plus or minus 3%. So now what I do is I look at each one of these one by one. So if your range allowed is 3% of your expected volume, which is 3 litres, that equals 90 mils using this 3 litre syringe. So therefore, my range is 2.91 litres to 3.09 litres. So that's the range that I'm allowed. All right, so let's look at each one of our measured volumes and see that it's within the allowed range. So 2.99, 3.04, 3.02, 3.06, 3.05, 3.07, okay, 3.10 is too high, 3.10 is slightly too high outside of the range, 3.09 is just within the range. Two of my measured volumes are outside of the allowed plus or minus 90 mils or 3% on my expired volume. So that's when you're pushing the syringe handle in. Looking at the volumes inspired, okay, 2.99 is okay, 3.01, 3.04, 2.99, 3.05, 3.03, 3.01, 3.04, 3 and 3.07. So all my inspired measured volumes, so that's when you're pulling the syringe handle out, all of those are within the allowed plus or minus 90 mils of the syringe volume. If you're looking at it as a volume or a percentage, you're going to have the same results. Just one is displayed as a volume and one is displayed as a percentage. So these here are looking at the percentage difference between what the spirometer actually measured versus the syringe volume and all of these must be within plus or minus 3%. So all of these are fine except that this one is a little bit too high, this one is a little bit too high, this one is fine, yeah everything is fine, all of the inspired volumes are fine. So what I'm seeing from step number three is that I've got two measured volumes that were outside of the allowed range of plus or minus 90 mils or 3% of the syringe volume. Step number four is looking at your flow rates. Okay, so now what I know about this software is that if you look over here, look here, here's your target flow, here's your low flows, can you see 0.5 liters? your medium flows at that the target flow is one liter and your high flow which is at above six liters. So usually when checking this I say maybe 
check for about 0.5 to 1 liter per second, from 1 to 2 liters per second, and above 6 liters per second. And if you're looking here at the actual results, you expected 0.5 liters per second. These are your flows expired. That's the rate at which the syringe was pumped. And your flows inspired. You did it very, very slowly for the low flow. All of them are within... One is just above one liter per second, but not too bad. I'm still happy with these low flows. So these are my low flows here. This lot over here. Okay, this is my medium flow, and this is my high flow. Okay, so let's see, our medium flow is expected at one liter per second, and approximately one to two liters per second, round about medium. Okay, so expected at one, and all of these were between one and two liters per second. So I'm very happy with how fast the syringe was moving for my medium flows. My high flow above 6 liters per second, so we've achieved above 6 there, above 6 there, above there. Slightly low on this one. Okay, and the others are all good. They're all above 6 liters per second. All right. So what I'm seeing so far is that at my high flow rates, I've got two measured volumes expired, which are outside of the 3% difference allowed between the measured and the syringe volume. And I also know that on one inspired, when I pulled the syringe in, I pulled it too slowly. So already I know that I'm going to repeat this calibration because I want all my measured volumes to be within plus or minus 90 mils or 3% of the syringe volume. Let's just have a quick look at the graphs. So on the graphs, you can see that this is a flow volume graph. So this is showing you volume, and if you look here, it's one and a half liters and one and a half liters, that's three liters volume. So we can see that the syringe was a three liter syringe. And if you look here at the flow rates, you can see you've got a low flow, you've got medium flows, and you've got high flow. And on, so this is your, this is your expired. Okay, so that's pulling the syringe handle out, and this is inspired. So that's, um, sorry, that's pushing your syringe handle in. That's pulling your syringe handle out. And here you've got your low, your medium, and your high flow rates. Okay, so we can see that all of that was achieved. So how would I comment on this then? So step number five is speaking about the validity of this calibration. So I would write something like this linearity check is not valid as two measured volumes fall outside of the allowed 90 mils or plus or minus plus or minus 90 mils or 3 percent of the syringe volume at high flow. Additionally, one syringe stroke at high flow was performed too slowly. That one there, remember that one is less than six liters per second. Uh, was performed too slowly to to measure that to to measure your measured volumes at a high flow rate. Um, this calibration should be repeated. Okay, so there you go. So now step number six: sign, date. Let's say first of October, twenty twenty. And that's it. You've done your six steps of reporting. So let's just recap. Step number one, date and time. Step number two, ambient conditions. Step, step number three, measured volumes as opposed to your syringe volume. Step number four, looking at that you used a low, a medium, and a high flow rate. And you can see it on the graph as well. 
Step number five is a validity statement, and step, step number six is sign and date. Good. All right, we have a second example calibration report, and this time you will see that this is a multi-flow calibration check. Now, the difference between a linearity calibration check and a multi-flow is that on a multi-flow, you only need one pump of each different flow rate. So one low flow, um, there's your target flow, you see one low flow, one medium flow, and one high flow, whereas on the linearity check, you have to have three low, three medium, three high. Let's look at this report. Now remember, you just take your six steps and you apply them to any report that is in front of you. So let's start by looking at the date and time. So up here, step number one, the date and time is correct. That is the date and time that I actually did this calibration check. Step number two would be looking at our ambient conditions. So remember that you need to look at what the ambient conditions were and know if they fall within the range. So let's just put the ranges in, 17 to 35 degrees Celsius, 30 to 75% humidity, and barometric pressure 600 to 1100 HPA. Right, so those are the ranges. All of these are within the allowed range of the allowed ranges. So my ambient conditions are good. Step number three, I'm looking at my measured volumes versus my syringe volumes. So let's make a big number three here. So this is measured, this is looking at your volumes. So when I look here, my expected volume was three liters. Okay. My volume expired on my low flow. So can you see here that these are your, this is your low flow there, your medium flow and your high flow there. Okay, so let's see. So my volume expired was 3.04. What is my range allowed? So my range allowed is 90 moles on volume, plus or minus. And on percentage, it's plus or minus 3%. Okay, so let's look at each one one by one. So that's within the range, that's within the range. That one is a little high. Okay, so this one is within 90 moles, plus or minus. Remember that that's 2.91 to 3.09 liters, that's the range allowed. If you take plus or minus 90 moles, that's plus or minus 90 moles, that one is and that one is. So we've got one measured volume, it's the volume measured at high flow, which is outside of the allowed range. All right, then we look at our, okay, our percentage deviation, so it stands to measure that if the volume is within range, that one is outside of range, then if it's within plus or minus 3%, that is correct. This one is outside of the range. So that's my volumes. Step number four is looking at the flow rates. So my target flow, low, medium, high. So this is low, medium, high flow. Um, and I can see that I pumped both of these at a low flow between about 0.5 or less than one liter per second. So both the expired and the inspired is correct. My medium flow between about one and two liters per second, both of those are correct. Now with my high flow, both of them are a little low. A high flow should be around about at least six liters per second. And both of these are only 5.66, 5.55, so both of these are low. Okay, so my, my flow rates for low and medium are good, but my flow rate for high is not good. So I'm going to need to repeat this test. Let's look at how the flow rates look on the graphs. So this is also number four. So here this is expired, inspired. So that's expired, inspired. And here is low, medium, and high flow. And here is low, medium, and high flow, inspired. And I can see that I've got three very nice distinct flows. Low, medium, high, low, medium, high. I'm happy with the way the syringe was pumped. Only problem is I just fall short a little bit here on my inspiratory loop, as I didn't quite go above six liters per second, and that's where I get these 5.66 and 5.55. So as I say, I'll have to redo the calibration for that. Let's just quickly look at how the flow rates look on the volume time graph. Okay, if you look at this volume time graph here, this would be your high flow, your medium flow, and your low flow, because here you're looking at time. So you can see that on the low flow, it took around about just short of six seconds to perform. On the medium flow, it took just around about two seconds to perform. And on the high, it took about half a second to perform. 
So that shows you your flow rate. So step number five, your validity statement. I'm just going to write it over here so that we can see it. This calibration is not valid for linearity because my measured volumes at high flow are outside of the allowed plus or minus 90 mils which is also 3% of my syringe volume. Okay. And additionally, my high flow rate, high flow expired and inspired was too slow. Repeat calibration. Oops. Calibration. Okay. Good. And then steps number six, sign and date. And that's your six steps to checking any calibration report. Step number one, date and time. Two is ambient conditions. Three is measured volumes versus the syringe volume. Step number four is looking at your flow rates, which is also here and here. Step number five is your validity statement. And step number six is sign and date. Good. We have our third calibration report here to look at and this time this is a straightforward calibration check and that's another name just for a volume calibration. Now you can see that it looks a lot simpler than the linearity and multi-flow calibrations and the difference between a volume calibration check and a multi-flow and linearity is that we're really just looking at the measured volume. It doesn't matter how fast or slow you move your syringe, what the flow rate was. We don't look at the volume at different flow rates. We just look at the volume on its own. So this is a straightforward volume. Now remember that the guidelines say that you need to be doing a linearity calibration check daily before the first patient of the day. Anyway, so let's apply our six steps to this calibration report. So step number one is looking at the date and time, and I know that that was correct, so I'm going to check it. Right, that's put on number one there. Step number two is looking at your ambient conditions. So there you've got your temperature, humidity, and pressure, and all of them are within the allowed ranges. Okay, so that's number two, that's your ambient conditions. And remember to just, for the time being, just document your your ranges. I'm just quickly writing these here for you and I'll show you in a sec. 600 to 1100 HPA. Okay, so you can see that your temperature is within the allowed range, your humidity is within the allowed range, and your pressure is within the allowed range. Step number three is looking at your measured volumes as a percentage of your syringe volume. Okay, so there is your target flow. You used a three liter syringe. I can see it here. I can see it here. Can you see this is volume? So you can see you've got one and a half and one and a half. And here you can see it again because this axis here is volume. So that's your flow volume graph. This is your volume time graph. And you can see that around three liters of air was measured. Okay, now let's look and see if our measured volumes are within our syringe volume, within 3% of the syringe volume. So remember that when you're using a three liter syringe, you're allowed a deviation of plus or minus 90 mils, which is equal to 3% of three liters. Okay, so I look at each one of my volumes expired, each one of my volumes inspired, and all of those are within the allowed ranges of plus or minus 3%. All right, you see that's 90 mils, sorry, they're within plus or minus 90 mils. And when looking as a percentage, they're within plus or minus 3%. So this is very simple. We do not worry about the flow rates here. You see, I've got nothing on flow. It doesn't matter how fast or slow the syringe was pumped. We are happy. So what we could comment on on this report is, so number four would be flow rates. So this is no, no flow uh, measured, 
okay, because this is a volume calibration, volume calibration check. Oops. Okay, now step number five would be a va your validity statement. This is a valid volume calibration check as all measured volumes fall within plus or minus 90 moles which is 3% of the syringe volume. Okay, so as I say, nothing to do with flow rates here. Step number six is sign and date. So there's my name and the date. And Bob's your uncle. You've got a valid volume calibration report. No need to repeat this one. So Shanti has finished her blow. I'm happy with the quality of the results, which I checked at the time of the visit. She has left and now I am evaluating my report. There are 10 steps that I apply to evaluate this report in an orderly fashion. So I don't go to step number four until I've done steps number one, two and three. So let's start at step number one. So step number one, very simply, is checking the patient details and the calibration details. So let's start with calibration. So if I look at this report in totality, the only thing that I can see on calibration is that there has been a correction for the measurement of body temperature, pressure, saturated with water vapor, and that these were the correction factors that have been used. In terms of calibration report itself, I would have to find the relevant calibration and keep it with this test itself, or if you're keeping digital copies, you must be able to find the matching calibration to the patient report, especially if you want to refer the patient out anywhere. So here's my calibration data, the only thing available on this record. So there you go. That's your calibration data. Okay. And here is your subject data. Right. So when it comes to subject data, remember the things that affect your reference values are your age, so she's nine years old, and I know that's true. Um, she's female, she's 128 centimeters tall, she's African, and if you want to, you can check your height, your weight and body mass index, always a good idea, even though they don't affect your reference values. And basically what I'm doing is I'm checking these things against my patient file. Okay, so we don't have a patient file here, but how would you, what are you checking it against? You're checking for any obvious errors when you enter the data and you're checking it against the information in the patient file. All right, step number two is looking at your reference values. Now, remember that we want to be using the GLI reference values that were authored by Professor Kwanja and they were published in 2012. So I'm very happy that my reference values are correct. Step number three is looking at the acceptability and usability. Okay, so if they're not acceptable, are they usable? Usability, right, of my blows. Now what you can see is that I've got my measurements of spirometry. I've got a pre-bronchodilator test here, and I've got a post-bronchodilator test there. So when it comes to looking at the blows here, the blue ones are the pre-test, and the green ones are the post-test. Now, if they're pretty much superimposed, you can look at them together. Like I can see that all of the starts are good. So I am showing six ticks here, which shows that I've checked six blows. So the starts of all six of the blows were good. Now, when I look at the rise to peak of the test, I'm a little bit concerned that the pre-test especially, or this one especially, falls a little bit to the right, which would mean that the patient blew out a little bit slowly. So how do I check that? As I go to my back extrapolated volume, and the criteria for the BEV is that it must be less than 0.15 liters or 5% of the FEC, whichever is the greatest. So looking at these values here, 
okay, 0 0.08, 0 0.08, all of them are within 0 0.15 liters. So these are actually correct, both on the pre and again on the post, which means that I can actually, I can accept my risers to peaks. So all the pre's are good, all the posts are good. Now it comes to looking at the peak of the blow. So we want to make sure that the patient blew with the fastest effort and technique that they could. So I'm pretty happy. There is one little bit slightly less blow, but otherwise all the blows and maybe two slightly less blows, but I'm not that unhappy with it. I would say that all of these peaks are reasonable. Next thing, we look at the downward curve, and you can see that the downward curve should be smooth and continuous. No leaks, no obstructed mouthpiece, no cough, no glottis closure, no artifact whatsoever in the downward curve, and these are all good. So I give a pass to each one of the downward curve. End of the test, there should be no early termination. I always look at the end of the test here, together with what I see on the volume time graph to measure the end of the test. And I would say that they pretty much finish almost identically to each other and there is a lovely plateau on every one of these tests. This child did not terminate early. I can look at these here and here together with my forced expiratory time to see how long did she blow out for. She blew out for 5.9, 4.7, 4.8, 5.1, 5.2, 4 5.9 seconds. I think that's pretty good. So I'm happy to pass all the ends of test and to be sure that she did at least a one second plateau, failing that, she should have blown out for 15 seconds, failing that all of the tests should stop at exactly the same place or the FVC must be within 150 mils of the FIVC. Now you can see that she didn't quite do her FIVCs as well as she could but luckily we don't need to worry about that because we can see that she did not terminate this blow early. Good. Okay, let's go and look at repeatability. So remember repeatability is looking at the three blows together to see that they are identical. We do that by looking at the values for the FEC and the FEV1. Okay, so let's start by looking. So the highest FEC is 1.34, next highest 130. The difference is 40 mils, so I just put a little 40 there. So let's just put a number 4 over here because we're looking at repeatability. So the FEC is repeatable on the pre. The FEV1, 1.23 minus 1.22 is 10 mils. So the difference between the highest and the next highest, FEV1 is 10 mils within 150 mils. It's repeatable. So that's repeatable, that's repeatable, I'm happy. Let's quickly look at the post. Okay, the highest of the three best blows is 1.34, the next highest is 1.34, the difference is naught, this is 4, naught mils, and that's within 150 mils, and the highest FEV1 to the next highest is 10 mils, 129, 1.29 minus 1.28, 10 mils, repeatable. Good, right. Then I need to look at my session quality. Okay, so remember that's, that's a guidance of how much confidence we can have in the quality of this test result. And both the pre and the post tests are a grade A, which is wonderful. That means that we've got three acceptable blows pre and we've got three acceptable blows post. So we also put that as number four. And that on those three blows, the highest FEC was within 150 mils of the next highest, FEV1 within 150 mils of the next highest, and exactly the same on the post. So everything is looking great so far. Step number five is about knowing your lower levels of normal before you can actually interpret the test result itself. So number five, knowing your lower levels of normal. Now remember that for every one of the parameters of spirometry, it doesn't matter which one it is, you should be having a lower level of normal of minus 1.64. Z scores. That's the low. So if your result is higher than minus 1.64, equal to or higher than 1.64, it's abnormal. If it is lower, a Z score lower than minus 1.64, it is normal. So that's your lower level of normal if you're using Z scores. And if you're using percentage of predicted, then your lower levels of normal for FEC, 80%. For FEV1, 80%, remember I've predicted, 
Okay, your ratio is 70% actual, your peak expiratory flow is 80% and your FEF 25-75% is 65%. So now you have your lower, let's put a P and a P because those are predicted, this one is actual and you can see you've got your lower levels of normal if you're going to interpret using a Z-score which is the preferable way and if you have an old spirometer and you're using percentage of predicted then these are your lower levels of normal over here on the left. All right, let us look now at step number six at choosing which of this data to use for interpretation. Now remember there's two ways. The preferable way is to choose the data from the best test. So the best test is a new test created by the software of the computer which takes your highest FEC and your highest FEV1 whether or not they came from the same blow or whether they come from different blows. In this instance, your highest FEC of the three pre is 1.34 from trial seven, and the computer software has pulled that across, and your highest FEV1 is 1.23, your computer software has pulled it across. So these are now the values that will be used for interpretation. When it comes to the peak expiratory flow rate, the highest peak of the three will be chosen. And when it comes to the FEF 25-75%, which is not used primarily in interpretation, it is the FEF 25-75% from the test with the highest FEC. Okay, so there you go. So those have been pulled across. So this is your best test. If for some reason your software didn't show best test or wasn't set for best test, you would use the data from the best trial. Now, what we can see is that there were 10 blows and that trial seven is the best blow. And what makes the best blow? It's the test with the highest sum of FEC and FEV1 from each of the three blows. So let's just do it manually that you do know how to do it. So all you would do is add up your FEC and your FEV1 from each of the three tests. So let's just do this quickly. So that I'm just adding up in my head, just quick, quick, 2.57, and this would be 2.52, and this one here is 2, carry 1, that's 4, okay, and this one is 2.42. So if you've added up your FEC and your FEV1 from each of the blows, the one with the highest sum of is the best trial, naturally now, that's trial 7. Okay, let's quickly do the same on the post test. So we want to be using our best test as the preferable data that we use for interpretation. Failing that, we take our best trial. The software has actually lined them up for us as best, second best, and third best. If you had to do it manually or you, you weren't sure or whatever your software shows you is something different, you would do a quick sum of. So that's three, one, six, two, six, three. 2, 6, 2, and what are we here? 0, 6, okay, 2.60. So this here is your best trial. Okay, so you're with me. So now we're going to interpret using the data from the best test for the pre and for the post. All right, so where do we begin? When it comes to interpretation, you look at the shape of your graphs. You look at some important things. The first thing is you look to see that there's no concavity on the downward curve. Remember, concavity would show you that there's some obstruction. I don't see any concavity here. It's a pretty straight downward line. And here I can see that not too much volume was lost. Okay, so at the moment, by looking at the shape of this graph, I think that it's looking pretty normal. And if you look at the, you can see here that you've got your upper and your lower levels of normal, you can see that this blow fell almost in the middle of the upper and lower levels of normal, so it's most likely to be normal. But let's confirm this now by looking at our z-scores and our percentages of predicted. So the first place you would start is looking at your ratio, and when you look at your ratio, your z-score is 0.24, it's normal, okay? So this means that this test is not obstructive. If the z-score is above minus 1.64, Z scores, the test is not obstructive. It may still be normal or restrictive, but at the moment it is not obstructive. All right, then you come to your FEC. Your FEC is above the lower level of normal. Okay, 
and your FEV1 is above the lower level of normal. So already I know that this is a normal spirometry test. So on your pre, the computer is correct, it is a normal spirometry. Please do not rely on your spirometer to give you the interpretation of the result because they are not always set correctly or sometimes the interpretation algorithm is not correct and you will get a strange report there which is not true of what the result actually is. Good, are you with me still? Okay, let's go on to looking at the pre-result if you're using percentage of predicted. So remember, we've looked at the graphs, now we look at our ratio first. Remember when you're using percentage of predicted, you always look at the actual FEV1 to FEC ratio rather than the percentage of predicted. So that one is above 70%. We don't like to use fixed cutoffs and remember that in a child it should be 80 to 90% here. Sorry, not 70. 70 is for an adult, 80 to 90 for a child. So you can see that this actual percentage is fine for a little girl of nine years old. So that's good. And then the FEC is above 80% of predicted and the FEV1 is above 80% of predicted. And using percentage of predicted to interpret, it's a normal spirogram. Let's look at the interpretation post bronchodilator. Okay, let's look at your FEV1 FEC ratio after the bronchodilator, 0.98, that's perfect. 0 0.83, 0 0.31, all of these are normal. So this is a normal spirogram. Okay, there's a normal spirometry. If we look at the percentages of predicted, start by looking at the ratio. There we go, it should be between 80 to 90 percent. So this is 96 percent, 96.5, it's looking great. FEC is normal, FEV1 is normal. We have a normal spirometry using percent predicted and Z scores. Step number eight would be to grade the test. So step number eight is grading. Okay, let's just put a number seven here. This is for interpretation. Okay, so grading, there's no grading, no grading. It's a normal spirometry test. So there's no point in trying to grade something that's not there. You would only grade an abnormality. All right, so that's that. Step number nine would be recording and reporting. Okay, so what would you want to comment on? You would want to comment on effort and technique. I would say that she blew with excellent effort and technique. Okay, from my pre-spirometry screening questionnaires, I know that she had no medication taken today. Taken today. She did the test standing. There were no, no particular issues. So it was a first spirometry, first um, spirometry test. And she really did very well. And I would say that the results are a true reflection of lung function most likely. So I'm very happy with everything. And then lastly, step number 10 would be storage. And you would maybe keep a paper copy in the file in patient file, usually that's what people are still doing these days, and you might have a digital copy, digital copy in the software, in the spirometer software, and you could say maybe there's a copy in the cloud or on a secure private system, or maybe there's a copy kept off-site. Okay, so that's the 10 steps to checking your spirometry, and yeah, I think this is a very good test and I'd be very happy to accept it and to interpret it knowing that it was very well done. Right, this is Riley's spirometry test result and what I would suggest is that you look at, the, at Shanti's result first, the practical looking at hers, because this one I'm going to go a little bit quicker like you would in a real life workplace. So let's just go through it step by step. So the first thing I'm going to do, step number one, is I'm going to check the patient details and the calibration details. Calibration details are here, just a simple correction factor. You would need to look for your calibration report in your records if you ever needed to pull it out because you don't have all the calibration data on this actual spirogram. Here, we're looking at age, he's six years old, gender, height, and ethnicity, he's African. So 
All of these details are correct. Patient and uh, subject and calibration data is there. Step number two is looking at your reference values, and we did them according to GLI, which is great. That's exactly what we want. Step number three is looking at the acceptability and repeatability of the actual graphs themselves. So these are the pre and the post. You can see that they're really looking very identical. He blew for a six-year-old. He blew with excellent effort and technique. I check each section of my graph and I look at each and every one of my blows. I have three blows pre, I have three blows post. And in all those three pre and in all those three post, I am really, really happy with my start, the rise of the test, the peak, the downward curve, end of test, and time. So what I can see, there's one that is slightly short there. There, there's one test that possibly he terminated a little bit earlier than the others, but on the post tests, on the pre, they pretty much have met a plateau, even though he finished the one a little bit earlier than the others. And if you look at the forced expiratory time here, you can see he achieved 2.6, 3.9, 5.1, 4.9, 4.6, 4.5. So not too bad. The one was a little bit less than the others but I don't think it's affected the test result because even on that one, there is a plateau. All right, so that's number three, acceptability. Let's check repeatability. You look for the highest FVC, which happens to be in trial six. Next highest FVC is in trial two. The difference is 30 mils, so I'm very happy with that. FEV1, you look for the highest to the next highest. In this instance, it's in trial two. Second highest is in trial nine, the difference is 10 mils, and I'm really happy with the repeatability of these tests. They're very repeatable, less than 100, 100 mils, um, because remember, he's under the age of six, so the criteria changes from 150 to 100 mils. Looking at the post, I look for my highest FEC, trial four, next highest trial one, difference is 20 mils. Okay, so that's pretty good. FEV1, I look for my highest is 119, my second highest is also 119, naught mils. Both of these are wonderful, both well within the limit of 100 mils. All right, so repeatability is there. Quality grade A for pre, A for post. I was so lucky, these children blew so beautifully. So my tests are all acceptable and they are both repeatable and they are both pre and post are a quality grade A. Step number five is knowing your lower levels of normal. So I know that Z scores, my lower level of normal is minus 1.64. My, if I use percentage of predicted, my allowed is 80, 80, 80 to 90, depending on the age of the child. Remember that the ratio is on a sliding scale. Peak is 80 and if you have 25, 75% is 65% of predicted. All right, step number five is really just Reminding yourself what are the lower levels of normal when you're going to interpret this test. Step number six is choosing the data from either the best test, in this case pre, post, best test values, these values here, or using the best trial. So when we use the best test, that's preferably what we need to do and the software gives it to us. If the software wasn't enabled for best test, we would take the best trial, which is the trial with the highest sum of FEC and FEV1. So let's quickly calculate those out. Okay, this is 2.54. So all I'm doing is I'm adding up the FEC and FEV1 of each of these. So then if I add this one, let's quickly do it together. Two is one, that's five, that's two. 2.52, and on the last one, it's... 7, 4, and 2, 2.47. So you can clearly see that this is the highest sum of, so trial 2 is the best trial. All right, on the post test, let's do a quick addition of the FEC and FEV1 to see which is the best trial for interpretation. So 5 and 9 is 4 carry 1 is 4, 2.44, 9, 3, 2.39, and one carry one is three, 2.31. Okay, so clearly trial four is the best. Now this software is really good, as I said, and it actually just orders the trials for you 
based on the highest sum of the FEC and FEV1. Step number seven, interpretation. First thing I do is I look at the shape of the graphs. There's no concavity on the downward curve suggesting an obstruction and there's no loss of volume on the volume axis here indicating restriction. So at the moment I would say that this is a normal test. When I come and look at the Z scores, all my Z scores are above the lower level of normal of minus 1.64. So the pre-test is absolutely normal. And the post-test, looking at the ratio first and then the FEC and FEV1, all absolutely normal. Using percentage of predicted, remember that I look for my actual percentage of predict, uh, FEV1, FEC ratio from the actual best test itself. 92.9 above the lower level of normal depending on the age of the child that is normal percentage of predicted FEC and FEV1 above 80% of predicted so using percent predicted and Z scores the pretest is normal and using the Z scores and percentages of predicted for the post test that is normal as well so again here you go step number seven the machine has interpreted it as normal. Do not rely on the machine interpretation for this. Step number eight would be grading. Okay, so grading, there's no grading because there's no abnormality. Okay, so if we were to grade an abnormal test, we would look at the highest FEV1 um, percentage of predicted or Z score. And that would be what we would use with our grading table to actually grade the test itself. And then lastly, step number nine, recording and reporting. So what I would say about this is this child blew with excellent effort and technique. I was very happy with his blow. Okay, he had no medication on the day, which I established when I was asking questions before he actually did the test. He did the test standing. It was his first spirometry. And I would say something like results reflect lung function. So what that means is that I have confidence in the test result, which you can also see in the fact that it is a grade A. And then last but not least, storage and record keeping, paper copy and file, and digital copy on computer. Okay, so that's your 10 steps to checking your spirometry, and it's, it's a very logical way of looking at the result, and you can't make any mistakes or miss any data if you do it like this. So there you go, Riley did a really, really good test. Right, so what I thought I would do is give you at least one different calibration report that you know that you can apply the six steps to whatever calibration report you're looking at. So let's go through our six steps one by one on this particular calibration report. Okay, so step number one is looking at your date and time. There it is, step number one. Step number two is looking at your ambient conditions, and on this one they have them. On a lot of calibration reports, you won't see your ambient conditions, but here I can see that this is within the allowed range of 17 to 35 degrees Celsius. This is between barometric pressure this time. It's millimeters of mercury, not hectopascals. So that's in my range is 450 to 825, okay, millimeters of mercury. So that's within range. And my relative humidity has got to be between 30 to 75%. So all my ambient conditions at the time of calibration are correct. All right, my target volume is three liters. So I can see that I've got a three liter syringe. And this pneumatic calibration actual volume is like an average of all the expired and all the inspired measured volumes. But let's look at the measured volumes one by one. So step number three is looking at your volumes. So looking at the expiratory flow, so that's when you pump your syringe handle in, almost like a patient breathing into the machine, but just in a controlled way with the syringe itself, which is a known volume. We expected three liters. And then on the first pump, the patient measured 3.06, on the second 2.95, 2.96 and then on the inspiratory volume, so in other words when the syringe handle was being pulled in, almost like a patient doing a forced inspiratory vital capacity, you expected three liters and this is what the patient actually measured. So let's look at these measurements one by one. What is my allowed range? My allowed range is plus or minus 90 mils or 3% 
when you're using a three liter syringe, which we know we are using, okay? So therefore that's within 90 mils. So remember your range allowed then is 2.91 to 3.09 liters. That's 90 mils less and 90 mils more of your three liter syringe. So I look at each one of my measured values. Can you see that they are all within the allowed 90 mils range? Okay, that's 60 mils more, 50 mils less, 40 mils less, 20 mils less, 40 mils less, and 30 mils more. All within the allowed range of plus or minus 90 mils. If you wanted to, you could look at your percentage. So this measured value, read 2% more, 2% less. So let's just say this is plus 2%. This is minus 2%. This is minus 1%. This is plus 1%, this is minus 1%, and this one is minus 1%. Okay, so that's looking good. Right, let's look at our flow rates. So on this one here, the peak expiratory flow rate, that's your expiratory flow rate, so that's like pushing the syringe handle in. But we have no peak inspiratory flow rate here, so you can't see the movement of the syringe on the way in. So whatever is missing on your calibration report, you can't assess it. Obviously, it's all dependent on the software. But for this one, your flow rate there, 9.93, that's your high flow. 5.07 is your medium flow, and 1.22 is your low flow. Okay, so these are my measured volumes at high flow, my measured volumes at medium flow, and my measured volumes at low flow. And I would say that these flow rates were conducted correctly because remember low flow you want around about 0.5 to 2 liters per second is low flow medium is four around about well on this one let's just say around about four to six liters per second and on the high flow you want a minimum of six liters per second so these are pretty good so the flow rates were done correctly if we had to look at our flow volume graph you can look here as your low flow expired, your medium flow expired, your high flow expired. Remember this is expiration, this is inspiration. Okay, and so this is your low flow inspired, medium flow inspired, and high flow inspired. Well, these are actually how fast you pumped the syringe. If you were looking at your volume time graph, this is your high flow, your medium flow, and your low flow. So. This is a good calibration. So what we could say here is calibration is valid as all measured volumes. So that's, there's your measured volumes there, 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 and there. Okay, are within the allowed, so plus or minus 90 moles, which is 3% of the syringe volume at low, medium, and high flow rates. So it's good. Step number six, sign and date. So this was done on the 28th of the 9th, 2020. And there you go. You've reported on this one is a multi-flow calibration check. Remember, because it's multi-flow, not linearity, because we only have one pump at each of low, medium, and high flow expired, and low, medium, and high flow inspired. But that is what the software gives you, so that's what you do. So, all good.